Okay. All right. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks for showing up this morning. Uh, I guess a few people had a late night last night. Uh, I know I did. <laughs> um, so uh, my name is Matt Ray. Uh, this is Justin Shepard. Uh, just the first thing to get started, uh, this is a hands-on workshop, but you are not expected to actually, uh, you can do everything we cover in the demo if you want. Uh, we have mirrors, you can download all the pieces, you can install all the packages. Uh, if you follow the instructions, you can do the exact same demo that we're going to do. You can do it right now if you want. Uh, probably better if we all paid attention and uh, you can just download it afterwards and run it at your leisure. It's all on GitHub, uh, it's all on the mirrors. But uh, yeah, feel free to uh, kill the hotel wireless while you're here. Because um, that's, uh, that's why we packaged everything up for you on the, uh, the wireless that we brought. Um, and we threw up mirrors as well. But uh, uh, you know, go download gigabytes and gigabytes. Yeah. Um, Let's see if we can kill it with 40 people. Yeah. Uh, so what, uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to uh, you know, go ahead and download the, uh, the instructions there so you can follow along what's, what's happening. But we're going to provide a background about the project, about what we've been doing. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and dive into the cookbooks, the code, uh, you know, talk about all the different pieces of what the demo actually is, and show you know, what's going on with all this uh, uh, fun stuff we have going uh, with Chef and OpenStack. Is there anyone here already uh, who's not familiar with Chef? Okay, uh, then I will uh, give a quick reset on, on Chef. I don't think I have too many slides on that, uh, but uh, just a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Matt Ray. I work at OpsCode. Uh, we are the company that makes Chef. Uh, my title is Cloud Integrations Lead. Uh, this is, I've been at all the OpenStack summits. Um, and uh, there's you know, email, GitHub, IRC, Twitter, uh, all that stuff. Uh, it, with me, holding the laptop, uh, is Mr. Justin Shepard. Uh, I'm private cloud architect at Rackspace, uh, part of the RCB Ops team that has been doing the Chef Cookbooks for a long, long time. Uh, at one point, we had started doing it, and everyone forked from us, not because of technical merit, but more because we existed. Uh, so then Matt and a bunch of the other involved parties, which we'll get to, have kind of come back together and take the best of all the worlds and produce yeah. the kind of canonical cookbooks. That's a good start. <laughs> uh, OK, so rather than dive immediately into the Chef for OpenStack stuff, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Chef, uh, Chef is an open source configuration management and automation framework. Uh, it provides uh, the ability to manage large numbers of machines. Uh, it, uh, uh, it's built on the idea of infrastructure as code. This means that everything that you do to a machine uh, can be traced back to source code. Uh, so you can, uh, you know, the packages that you install, the servers they talk to, how all these things work together uh, is tracked in source control. So if you need to uh, move your infrastructure from one location to another, if you need to auto scale, if you need to uh, recover broken, missing machines that go down because you're running on an unstable cloud, um, Chef is really good in that sort of situation. Uh, we have support for just about every platform. Uh, you know, Linux, Windows, Solaris, AIX, you know, uh, OS X, uh, and, and on and on. Um, and uh, it's Apache licensed, so people take it, embed it in lots of other products. Uh, that's the, the, the short overview of Chef. Uh, it's written in Ruby. Uh, the, the client is written in Ruby. Uh, it does not have a configuration language of its own. It actually just extends Ruby. So the nice advantage of that is uh, you have, Chef provides primitives and resources for managing things like packages, and we're gonna see, we're gonna see a lot of uh, recipes, which are how Chef configures machines. Um, but uh, the advantage of being in Ruby is if you need to do something more dynamic, if you need to uh, calculate something, access the library. Ruby's a really great language because it already has support for interacting with lots of things already. It has a huge community, very vibrant open source uh, ecosystem, People are doing just about everything with it. Uh, and that's exciting <laughs> uh, in a good way. Um, so you know, feel free to ask questions as we're going. Uh, we will be diving into some uh, recipes uh, as we go so you can see what it looks like if you're unfamiliar with it. 
Uh, and you know, I'll be trying to explain some of the concepts as we go. So a quick overview of the Chef for OpenStack project. Uh, so Chef for OpenStack is a project. It is not a product, per se. There's nobody who says, you know, hey, you know, call up Opscode and we will sell it to you. Uh, what will happen is you call up Opscode and will say, have you talked to somebody to do OpenStack for you? Because we're the company that makes Chef. We're not an OpenStack company. But a lot of companies that are using Chef are doing OpenStack. So HP's public cloud, uh, IBM's smart cloud, Rackspace private cloud. Uh, these are all built using Chef. Uh, there are a lot of other projects. Uh, Crowbar has Chef embedded in it. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting a couple others. But uh, the, the, the idea really is Chef is a really great way to uh, put OpenStack together because it's complicated. Uh, OpenStack is not simple to configure. Uh, it's not simple to manage. So what we did was we formed a community around the automated deployment and management of OpenStack. You know, setting up and configuring OpenStack should not be your company's secret sauce. Your secret sauce should be your support or the value add you put on top of OpenStack. Uh, so we formed this project to reduce the fragmentation and increase collaboration. Uh, the next slide, I'll show you some of the people who are currently involved. Uh, okay, well, we have an IRC channel, uh, we have a mailing list, uh, we have a Twitter account, you know, community kind of stuff. Uh, but here's some of the companies currently involved. Uh, AT&T is using these cookbooks in production. And there are multiple data centers, several thousand machines. Um, AT&T is using them. Uh, Dell is going to be contributing back to these. They've used them in the past. You know, as Justin mentioned, there's a kind of a genealogy of the cookbooks that have been branched and forked and merged. And you know, a lot of people have used these cookbooks over the years. Uh, the, they actually got their start at Anso Labs with the bear release. So it kind of goes back pretty far. Uh, DreamHost is using these. Uh, Gap is, now they're using Rackspace Private Cloud. Uh, HP is using you know, branches of these. HubSpot's using these in production. IBM is using a fork of these. Korea Telecom is using these in production. Opscode is using these in production. Rackspace is using these in production. And SUSE is building tools with this as well for their uh, OpenStack distribution. And there's even more people. Uh, if you go through the Git history, you'll find some interesting people. Um, so that's currently who's involved. It's a very vibrant ecosystem, a lot of, uh, a lot of different players. Um, getting started on the technical side, the requirements that we have for our project. Uh, we are using Chef 11. That's the current stable release. Uh, we try to stay pretty on top of all the latest features. Um, this allows us to, you know, uh, allows me as an Opsco employee to make sure we're kicking the tires on the rough edges of Chef and to make sure that the, the project actually takes advantage of all the latest features. Uh, we're using Ruby 1.9. Uh, Chef does support Ruby 1.8.7, but we don't want it to go there because that's been end of life by the Ruby community, even though lots of distributions are still shipping it. Um, we use uh, Food Critic and Chef Spec for basic testing. There's a lot of other testing that's there. Uh, that's you know, uh, a lot of testing that's there, and a lot more is coming. Uh, we use, if you're familiar with Chef, um, we are using the idea of attribute-driven uh, environments rather than putting attributes in our roles or other places. Uh, we try to keep everything at the environment level so we can, uh, ex so if you're not using uh, environments, perhaps like Crowbar, um, you can actually push, uh, you can inject attributes uh, other ways. But we try to keep them a nice uh, separation of the, the, the data from the source. Uh, and that's one of the ideas of Chef is as you build these cookbooks, um, you configure them with attributes from the outside so they behave like libraries. Uh, and, and so these have become you know, libraries for OpenStack. Uh, we keep the platform logic in our attribute files. So this means inside of our recipes, they're not case statements that say, you know, if we're on Red Hat, do this. If we're on SUSE, do this. If we're on Debian, do that. We put that in the attributes files to hide it away, make the cookbooks a little simpler. Um, currently, we're only using packages from the distros except where we're not. Um, and I say except where we're not because uh, if you're familiar with Grizzly, there's a lot of broken pieces. Um, DNS mask, uh, OpenV switch, these are built from source. So, um, and you know, this will change in the future. Uh, keeps off. changing. What? Swift off. Swift off, yeah. So there are definitely other pieces that are uh, not distro packages. And there's a couple of patches in place as well. Yeah, but packages only. Yeah, but it's still packages mostly. Uh, so StackForge. StackForge is uh, the official OpenStack place to put things that are not official OpenStack projects. 
Um, so uh, we have cookbooks uh, on uh, Stackforge. Uh, the nice thing about being on Stackforge is you get to use the OpenStack infrastructure for continuous integration, for the reviews, uh, the OpenStack CLAs. So you know that anything that gets committed to Stackforge is good to go for however you want to use your OpenStack projects. Uh, and that's important to you know, the legal people. Um, so github.com slash stackforge, cookbook dash OpenStack dash, and then we have cookbooks for block storage, common, compute, dashboard, identity, image, metering, network, object storage, and orchestration. So what's currently there is Grizzly. Uh, you note that metering and orchestration are there. Uh, orchestration is empty. Yeah. Um, you know, I know that, uh, I'm not going to say their name, but somebody's working on, on the, the orchestration cookbook, but since they haven't committed, I'm not going to out them. Uh, there is metering work that is, is in there. Uh, obviously, these are going to come online with Havana, but uh, the cookbooks are already there. And then we have operational support cookbooks. So these are reference implementations for how to configure messaging or your database. Note that they don't say ops MySQL or ops RabbitMQ. The idea is that these cookbooks are wrappers for the, uh, the databases or messaging systems that you want to use under the covers. So what we try to do is let you set attributes that say, hey, uh, my OpenStack database is MySQL. My OpenStack database is DB2 or Postgres or you know, whatever, and you, but you just use the ops database, which will call to the right cookbooks, uh, which allows us to become very modular and support lots of different configurations. Uh, and for messaging, same thing, you know, Rabbit, Cupid, uh, what have you. Uh, for deploying this stuff, so we have a chef repository uh, for deploying Grizzly. Um, GitHub.com, Stackforge, OpenStack Chef repo. Uh, this provides a reference examples of the environments and the roles for how to set this up. So uh, what, this is what we're actually using today. We're using a fork of this today that's been cleaned up for the demo, but it's a fork of this. Uh, so it has the, the example all-in-one deployment that we're using for, uh, with Vagrant today. Uh, this is, of course, gated by uh, reviewopenstack.org, and more examples are coming. More reference examples of, are coming of you know, different architectures for N plus one, like uh, you know, single controller with N compute nodes, or HA controller plus N compute nodes plus block and object storage. You know, different permutations, they'll all be in this repository uh, and all gated. Yes? Uh, so, so when you use reviewopenstack.org, uh, you can have tests that run on the code that people submit. And so we actually have, uh, we have uh, tests that run you know, against uh, the submissions so you know that, hey, this patch may break these things. And so the level of testing is continuing to increase daily. Uh, and so what happens in the, uh, the Chef repository is we actually use a, a tool called Spice Weasel that validates the roles, the environments, the cookbooks, the run lists that you say you're going to have. Uh, it actually checks, to the, it actually checks uh, that those files exist. You know, what a crazy idea. Um, and it catches bugs. And that's, that's the idea of gating. And it, uh, in the cookbooks, we actually do unit and functional testing. And uh, that is going to continue to increase with more and more vigorous testing. Um, anything? Yeah. So uh, we are providing reference implementations. Um, this is, uh, uh, we have deployment examples uh, in the documentation for the all-in-one compute, which is our Vagrant box. You know, a single box, you stand it up, everything is on it, you know, you can have Nova on a box. Um, that's what we're doing today. Uh, the single controller plus in compute, very common pattern in small deployments. You know, you got 10 boxes, hey, one of them's controller, nine of them are doing compute. You know, run 100 VMs, uh, that's good to go. Uh, more examples are coming. Um, so we'll just continue to iterate over this as we go, as we support more and more different architectures and deployments. Uh, we will be providing example HA configurations. Uh, we will not be following the, uh, the Grizzly Havana uh, HA documentation. Um, you want to say a little more about the? Yeah, so that's the, uh, the like Castexo gave a talk on it where they're doing the core sync uh, and pacemaker type of stuff. Um, we're going to be going a lot more with the keep alive method. So we'll have scale out on the API services. Um, we'll probably end up with a couple of MySQL implementations something like a master-master replication, master-slave replication, Galera. 
um, are some of the ones that people are starting to contribute. So speaking back to having the ability to do different modulars. Um, for the clustering on the uh, message bus, it's going to depend on the implementation underneath. So there will be like a rabbit clustering. Zero MQ, I'm not entirely sure what would be there, uh, and or Cupid think, yeah. will probably be a Coral Sync. No, we're not going to use Pacemaker. Unless somebody contributes Pacemaker. Uh, no one has. It's open source. So you can, if, as long as whatever you contribute does not break other people's stuff, and it's worked really well, that yes, if you want to write a Pacemaker Core Sync implementation, we will happily yeah. take it. No, no, it, it is not because of that. Uh, operationally, um, pacemaker is not super easily to automate. <laughs> uh, so uh, a lot of this is coming back from people that are running it in production. Yeah, it, it is the default, um, and uh, pacemaker is not uh, not very easy to uh, HAFI uh, or automate. Sure, sure. If if they provide if they provide the implementation, we'll take it. Um, I'm just saying, I know Rackspace and AT and T and IBM are not going down that route uh, because that that deployment architecture also does not scale past you know 100 nodes or so, uh, and the people who are deploying it like AT and T and IBM and Rackspace are definitely well over 100 nodes. Yeah. So it's not that we're blocking that from coming yeah. in. If anyone wants to contribute it, we're happy to accept it. It's just that. The people that happen to be running it in production right this second all have kind of settled on a very similar architecture, and we're all going to be contributing that one back instead of going off and building another one. But yeah, we, we definitely have a big umbrella approach, our big tent approach. Um, so if you have uh, an alternate implementation, it's really easy to wire these up different ways. Um, they're very, very modular, which is uh, interesting um, because you can say, well, I'm going to have you know, object storage but not block storage. I'm going to have you know, I'm going to run with any sort of different uh, architecture. Right now, we only have a few basics, but uh, with uh, the involvement of IBM, it's going very wide, uh, the architectures we're supporting. Um, <clears throat> operational uh, support is outside the scope of this repository. So we're not managing your logging, your monitoring, uh, or your hardware provisioning. Those are very opinionated fields that have many, many, many solutions, so they don't really belong in Stackforge. So people are using these with, uh, you know, on the provisioning side, you know, you have Crowbar, you have Xcat, you have Cobbler, you have, what do you guys use, Razor? Yeah, Razor. Uh, you know, I have a tool called Pixie Dust. There's lots of different implementations of provisioning. For monitoring, there's Nagios, there's Sensu, there's Graphite, there's... Zenos. Xenos, uh, there's sure. you know, all sorts of stuff for logging, there's you know, Logstash, there's Syslog, you know, it just goes on and on. They're not in this repository. Uh, you can find examples of those things outside. And, and the docs will probably point you that way, but we'll try to keep that out because that's too much stuff in one repo. Uh, docsopsco.com slash openstackhtml. Uh, this is official uh, ops code documentation, Creative Commons licensed. Uh, it's on GitHub. Um, you know, no CLA required to contribute. Uh, these get generated fairly frequently. Um, what is there? Uh, example architectures, deployment prerequisites, uh, installation docs, how to use these as a developer, uh, how to contribute. There is documentation in the readmes. Um, readmes are not a great way to document something large and complex across multiple repositories. Uh, so this is over here. You're welcome to contribute. We love uh, additional uh, examples. And uh, uh, the example deployments that are there are mine. Um, you know, I'm documenting my small lab of five machines, and I'm documenting ops code's deployment of uh, 30 boxes with you know, a couple hundred VMs, um, just so you can follow along from home. Um, I've been told that uh, there will be additional documents provided for thousands of machines. Um, looking forward to that. Uh, so documentation, always the, the best part of, of uh, using open source. Um, and again, the example deployments that are there, uh, uh, the Vagrant deployment we're doing today, uh, the developer lab of one plus n boxes, you know, that's my lab is the consumer grade hardware, that's uh, code for cheap. Um, <laughs> And then ops code stuff, which is enterprise-grade enterprise stuff. 
And uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, Havana will probably be branched like next week. Um, so this is the current Grizzly status. Uh, the the repositories that there, uh, it currently working on Ubuntu 12.04, uh, probably 13.04 and 13.10, but um, only testing with 12.04. Uh, OpenSUSE 12.3, SLES 11. Uh, there is some rel support, but I hesitate to put it on here because I'm not testing it yet. Um, currently for the databases, it's MySQL, uh, and SQLite is there for testing purposes. Uh, for messaging, RabbitMQ. On the compute side, KVM, LXC, QMU. Uh, on the network side, uh, there's Nova Networking and there's Quantum uh, with Open vSwitch. These are known to work. Uh, block storage, LVM, Swift uh, for the object storage. Dashboard, you can use Apache or Nginx as your backend. That's today. Uh, 1304 was working, um, and I had been working on it because I thought I was going to be using that in, in ops codes deployment, and then they said, ah, 1204 is fine. So I stopped working on 1304, and we're mostly sticking with the LTS releases for sanity, you know, because they move quickly, and uh, uh, LTS is at least a little more stable. Yeah, so we'll be hitting 1404. Yeah, we'll definitely be going to 1404. Um, you know, we won't take Grizzly there, but, uh, you know, we will... Stick with the LTS releases. As we see on the next slide, uh, this is the StackForge roadmap. Uh, we've had discussions about branching for Havana. Uh, I think it's been submitted up to the, you know, the masters of StackForge to branch our stuff for us. I don't think we can do it ourselves. Um, the current master branch will be renamed to Grizzly, and master will become Havana. Uh, the metering and orchestration cookbooks are already there, uh, and so they will you know, become officially part of the deployment. Uh, there is about to be a very large influx of contributors. Um, the current repo has contributors from all those companies I listed, uh, but uh, these, this repository is, you know, knock on wood, about to be uh, adopted by Rackspace, uh, IBM, and Dell, and SUSE. So there's about to be a, you know, force multiplier of people contributing all of them already have done Havana cookbooks. So the, you know, Havana will move rather quickly. Uh, what, what's uh, uh, more interesting is we will be branching for Ice House. You know, IBM would like to branch in December. Uh, so we will start tracking trunk. So this is, uh, we have a parallel Yes. So, uh, so we have, uh, the, the question was how will we track the different releases? And so in, in Git, there will be a branch called Grizzly. Uh, the cookbooks uh, in the different branches, uh, the, 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 uh, the versioning is tracking the current OpenStack release. So Grizzly was the seventh release of OpenStack. So Grizzly cookbooks start with seven. Havana cookbooks start with eight. Uh, Ice House will start with nine. Uh, using the tools uh, like Berkshelf, uh, it allows you to pin, uh, Berkshelf and Spice Weasel will allow you to pin the exact versions of the cookbooks you're using, the roles you're using, lock everything down so you can recreate previous implementations um, from the Chef repo. So if you need to keep deploying Grizzly, it's easy to do. Um, and you can say, you know, float on the, the seven release, but do not upgrade to eight. Uh, so. Uh, Yes. No, we do 1204. Yes, but we do all of our deployments on 1204 because it's the LTS release. Tracking the Ubuntu in betweens is very difficult. You can do it. We'll take the patches. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the the. In between releases are a little more uh, variable, but you know, with more resources, we'll be happy to uh, support those as well. Um, and so, development will continue on Grizzly as people, you know, are continuing to use it in production. But as uh, we move to Havana, as we move to, as we start tracking Trunk with Ice House, uh, you know, Git can easily support multiple branches. All the Chef tooling can support multiple branches, and uh, 
the uh, review OpenStack.org can handle multiple branches. So, you know, I expect us to have a you know stable stable minus one and trunk pattern uh, going for quite a while. Um, so, what's on the very short term roadmap uh, is Red Hat six support. Um, you know, Rackspace is is deploying Red Hat six. Uh, IBM and Dell are as well. Uh, there is already some support in, in the Grizzly cookbooks. I expect this to land in the Havana one, really. Um, you know, if somebody wants to continue working on Grizzly, they can, uh, but mostly that is going to be you know, Ubuntu. Uh, IBM, of course, very fond of DB2, so they will be uh, uh, bringing in DB2 support. Uh, at OpsCode, we will be switching to Postgres, um, as well as a couple other folks uh, are interested in using Postgres as their database as well. Uh, on the compute side, uh, there is bare metal support already uh, for Grizzly. It just has not been merged in, but uh, HubSpot is using bare metal with Grizzly uh, and their fork of these cookbooks. Um, there is a fork uh, with Docker support for Grizzly uh, that will probably not come into the Grizzly branch, but you know, it will probably definitely be in the Havana one, uh, as Docker was included in the Havana release. Uh, you know, if uh, ESX, Hyper-V, and Zen there are definitely people in the uh, existing community who want those uh, those hypervisors, and uh, these are these are the ones that are, are not currently there that we're going to be adding. So KVM, LXC, we already got. You know, um, you know these are things that will merge into you know what we have in our big matrix of of what uh, is there. Uh, IBM wants to use Cupid uh, for their messaging platform. I had Rabbit, uh, I had ZeroMQ listed. The people who are going to be using ZeroMQ have stepped back and are going to stick with Rabbit. If you want to do Zero, we're happy to take it. Uh, it's just kind of, these are things I know people are working on or already have. Okay. Uh, on the networking side, uh, there is a NYSERA cookbook um, that was for Folsom. If somebody wants to take that, forward port it, or somebody wants to do NSX, you know, you could do that. Um, or any other, uh, any other, uh, Neutron driver, um, and a couple folks have expressed interest in working on Open Daylight, which is supposed to have its first release in December. Uh, so that will show up in the Havana, maybe Ice House. I'm not sure when that shows up. Uh, on the block storage side, uh, there are cookbooks for Ceph. Uh, you know, Ink Tank has them, Dreamhost has them, Rackspace has them. Uh, you know, I know that OpsCode is planning on using Ceph for block and object storage. So that will become part of you know, the different architectures that are documented, uh, at least by me. Um, and so um, you know, Ceph will be an alternative for block and object storage, as well as continuing to use Swift. Uh, AT&T is using NetApp through and through. So some of that should merge into the mainline stuff. Um, if you have a different block storage backend, IBM has several. Uh, it will support those as well. So uh, we're happy to take patches, because those are very, very, very modular. They don't break stuff. Um, and then the last line there, source builds via Omnibus. Uh, Omnibus is a, a packaging tool uh, that OpsCode uh, has open sourced that we use for building the Chef client. Uh, the Chef client is a Ruby application. It runs on uh, you know, Red Hat, it runs on Ubuntu, it runs on Debian, it runs on Fedora and RHEL and Gentoo. Uh, it runs on FreeBSD, NetBSD, it runs on AIX, Solaris, Windows, XP, and later. Uh, the re and we use the same packaging tool for all these platforms. That's Omnibus. It allows you to install an application into Opt with all the dependencies that it needs without depending on your distro to provide you with Ruby or you know, uh, OpenSSL libraries that are up to date or whatever. Uh, so Omnibus is being used by a lot of folks for building applications that um, the underlying operating system doesn't have the right dependencies for you, but you want to control the fate of your application. You want to manage your stack uh, without interfering with anybody else. So the Chef client has its own Ruby, doesn't affect anybody else, it installs Adopt Chef, uh, put in your path and you're good to go. This Ops Code server does that as well. It's not a Ruby application, it's an Erlang Java application. Um, but we build that with Omnibus. There are already people working with Omnibus and OpenStack uh, to build you know, one-off, you know, uh, or not one-off, but to build their OpenStack packages uh, using Omnibus because they need backported patches and the distros are not providing the packages that they need. Um, so Omnibus will become 
supported. It will not be the default, obviously, but uh, there will definitely be people using Omnibus OpenStack packages. You know, because maybe you need to run OpenStack on something that does not have the latest Python or uh, whatever. Uh, so Zen is the platform that our public cloud uses. Um, our private cloud has been based off of KVM, and so that's one of the reasons we're going to bring in on Zen. Okay. Is there another question? Or okay. So yeah, that's uh, the StackForge roadmap. Uh, next week, the Ops Code Community Summit. So uh, if you're if you're having so much fun in Hong Kong, you don't want to go home. You can go to Seattle, um, where uh, there'll be a lot of other OpenStack Chef people who did not make this trip. Um, but uh, there will be a lot of more OpenStack discussions there. Um, got kind of a different cross-pollination group. Uh, and so the OpenStack roadmap will change a little more as more people uh, there uh, are involved. Um, so Chef uh, can definitely stand up your OpenStack. It can stand up all the infrastructure for running OpenStack. But maybe you're using uh, Chef with uh, you want to run applications on top of OpenStack. So Knife is the command line tool uh, that Chef provides for interacting with APIs. Uh, you know, Knife talks to the Chef server API, uh, Knife can talk to the OpenStack API. Um, the Knife commands that are available, um, you know, a quick list there, you can list the flavors, the groups, the images, the server, uh, you can create and delete servers from the command line, um, and obviously list them. Uh, just a quick run through of the examples. You know, hey, I want to list the flavors that are available on my server. Uh, I want to list the security groups that are available. Uh, I want to list the images that are available, uh, the servers that are running on my machine. Um, the reason this is important is you can create servers from the command line without interacting with the UI. You can automate this. You can put it on Jenkins. You can put it in the back end of, of uh, other tools um, to deploy OpenStack nodes uh, programmatically. Um, you know, and that's what it looks like when you SSH into a box. <laughs> uh, what's good about Knife OpenStack, uh, uses the OpenStack API. Uh, it's been, you know, working since Diablo, works on everything. It's been tested with all these different private and public cloud implementations. Um, you know, Knife OpenStack, if you're running chef-managed infrastructure on top of OpenStack. Um, you know, it has help, it has docs, uh, it's on GitHub. Uh, has tickets. You know, I'm just kind of running through this quickly uh, so you can see what's going on there. Um, the roadmap for Knife OpenStack, we're building a CI for it that's testing against lots of different OpenStack deployments so we can make sure that it's well supported. Uh, you know, if you're using it today, you probably get excited about some of these milestones that are coming. Um, you know, uh, but that's that. So let's talk about the walkthrough. Uh, like I said, we're not really you know, please go and download the, uh, the instructions and, you know, go back to your room tonight, recreate uh, what we're going to walk through. Um, you can do it now if you want, but, you know, I'd rather see your eyes. The plan is we'll go through the setup, we'll talk about the tools that are in place, we'll look at the Vagrant file, we'll see what's there, uh, we'll talk about the, the Vagrant environment that we're using, walk through the roles, look at the cookbooks, actually look at some source code, uh, log into the chef, uh, into the, uh, the OpenStack dashboard, and talk about using Knife OpenStack with Vagrant, which is kind of cool. So, the setup. I posted this earlier. Uh, Bitly, HK Chef, um, that's the instructions for how to set up the Vagrant demo. You know, uh, once you have Vagrant and VirtualBox installed, uh, there's a, uh, on the Rackspace uh, mirror, there's a tarball of all this. It's also on GitHub. It's the uh, OpenStack Chef repo uh, dash HK, which I think is in the instructions. Yeah. So, um, and then you'll download a provisional, <clears throat> a provisioner is uh, Ubuntu 12.04 box. It's just a vanilla, just enough operating system Ubuntu box. Uh, nothing on it. Uh, nothing up my sleeve. Uh, the tools that we're using, um, Bento is a uh, a tool uh, that Opscode uses to make um, just enough operating system images. You know, just very, very vanilla uh, OSs. You know, they, we, don't, we don't put Chef on them, so a lot of people use them with other tools. Uh, Bento, Wraps, Packer, uh, 
which is a, a, a tool for building uh, VMs, you know, building base boxes uh, that you use with other tools. Uh, Packer IO is the URL. Bento just wraps that. Yes? I'll go fix that. All right. Which one's that? Ruby. Yeah. Just why we're not doing a live demo. <laughs> uh, are, is the uh, I'll fix. the Vagrant plugin order changed? I don't think so. The Bergshelf one has to be last. I'll check. All right, um, we'll get that fixed. Uh, so Chef Zero is uh, is a relatively new tool. Um, Chef Zero is an in-memory Chef server uh, that um, allows you to do things like search and upload all your cookbooks to a server, and you get all the benefits of having a Chef server uh, with the big minus of no auth and uh, no persistence. Um, but it's great for testing. Um, so this allows us to actually spin up machines uh, without having them talk to anything external. Uh, we were trying to put this together where everything would be on a single uh, bento box, um, ran into a few uh, issues, which is, you know, uh, happens. So we were worried about bandwidth. Chef Zero keeps it all on the, on the box. Um, and then Berkshelf is a, a tool in the Chef community uh, that you use for tracking versions of cookbooks. It understands Git, uh, it, underst or it understands GitHub, URLs, local path, uh, the Chef community site, and so it allows you to pin the exact versions of the cookbooks you're using um, so you can always have you know, repro reproducible builds. Uh, and that's one of the really nice things about Berkshelf. So, uh, the Vagrant file. Um, I'm gonna pull this, actually pull this file up uh, things that we'll point out, the use of Vagrant Berkshelf, uh, Vagrant Chef Zero, and Vagrant Omnibus plugins, um, and that we're using the Chef Client Provider uh, with the environment of Vagrant and a run list of apt and all-in-one compute. So let's uh, actually pull up the Vagrant file that is in the repo. And the top of it you can't see. Uh, it says Vagrant require plugin. Um, you know, uh, Berks Vagrant Bergshelf, Vagrant Chef Zero, Vagrant Omnibus, I just mentioned those. Um, Vagrant Bergshelf reads that there's a file called the Berks file. It tells you exactly which versions of the cookbooks to use. You can pin them, you can float them, you can use semantic versioning on them. Um, so you can you know, really control the exact uh, uh, versions that you're using. Uh, Vagrant Chef Zero, when the Vagrant image spins up, it spins up the Chef Zero server and you have a Chef server available to your Vagrant box. Uh, Vagrant Omnibus installs the Chef client on the box, uh, the Omnibus client. Um, this way we, d we can use you know, vanilla uh, base boxes without having a Chef client baked into them. So if the Chef client gets upgraded, or if you don't want to use Chef, you have uh, that option. Um, if you're familiar with Vagrant, uh, this is a, a pretty straightforward Vagrant file. Um, you know, Berkshelf is enabled, Chef uh, Zero is enabled, uh, the Chef Zero repo path, this says, hey, look in the current directory, and there's an environments directory, there's a roles directory, um, and then it'll get the, the cookbooks from Berkshelf, and that's all it needs to know. It just looks in the local path. You can have a look somewhere else if you needed to. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, on the Omnibus Chef version, you can specify a specific version if you needed to test 11.6.2 or, or something like that. We're just floating on latest. You know, we're trying to stay current. Um, pretty, pretty simple stuff. Uh, then we have a little bit of configuration here for, uh, uh, for uh, that's weird, for a virtual box. Uh, we're forwarding ports from this machine. Um, we're moving 443 SSL onto 8443. So we can actually connect to the dashboard uh, from our web browser. Uh, we're opening up the Chef Zero port. So I can actually talk to the Chef server that's running in my Vagrant instance uh, if I needed to update the cookbooks or 
you know, uh, query information it has about the machine that's connected to it. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, and then the APIs for OpenStack, for the EC2 and, and uh, OpenStack APIs are exposed as well. So if I had other tools that needed to test against the OpenStack API, like Knife OpenStack, uh, I, those are actually exposed on the Vagrant image. Um, and that's pretty, pretty slick. Uh, we've got some virtual networks assigned to our VM. Uh, this way we can you know, create uh, networks for our compute guests. Uh, because we're doing all this stuff on a box, uh, we're bumping up the number of CPUs, the amount of memory, and we're adding the additional NICs there. Um, if you've used VirtualBox uh, and Vagrant, you know, it's fairly straightforward. I say that. Uh, then we're going to use the Chef Client Provisioner. Uh, this is actually going to run the Chef Client. Uh, the environment that we're using is Vagrant, uh, and the run list that we're using is the apt recipe and then the all-in-one compute role. Uh, the apt recipe doesn't have to get update. That way we have the latest repos. Uh, and then the all-in-one compute, we're gonna actually dive into that. Uh, and then we run our Ubuntu 1204 image, uh, the host name, Ubuntu 1204, the name of the VM box, ops code Ubuntu 1204. The URL there is where we keep all of our Bento boxes. Um, notice it's 1204 provisionalist, uh, very vanilla image. That URL is pretty stable. That's our Vagrant file. It's actually not that complex compared to some, you know, compared to others, it's more. Uh, so let's take a look at the Vagrant environment. Um, so this is our, our, our Vagrant environment. Uh, this is just a Ruby file uh, that is injecting attributes into our environment. So any machine that runs in the Vagrant environment uh, gets these attributes. Uh, we have a few settings here for MySQL. Uh, we are allowing remote root and uh, uh, root network ACL. Uh, and then we have our OpenStack, uh, our OpenStack attributes. Um, and this is, uh, if you're unfamiliar with Ruby, uh, this is how Ruby does hashes, you know, uh, with a little hash rocket there. Uh, we are in developer mode. This means that there are, the passwords are things like password or, you know, secret. Um, they're not, uh, uh, there is more complex uh, alternatives to how you configure this. Uh, we're just using the developer mode. Uh, we're, our identity attributes, we're using the templated backend. Our image attributes, we're not uploading images on the fly. Um, you could set this to true and it would go and upload the glance images uh, when the node runs. And then each time it would check to see if these are there. Uh, you could have a, a list of different images to upload with your URLs. Um, in this case, we're just doing Syros, uh, which is the, the one from the docs for, you know, example deployments. Um, and then there are multiple ways to wire these different cookbooks together. Uh, we're using roles. So when I need, uh, when a box needs to find another box, it looks for that, uh, for a machine that has that role. Um, these are all in the same box. So the searches will say, I'm looking for somebody with all-in-one compute. Oh, it's me, I don't have to search. Uh, but if I had, say, 100 machines, I would ask the chef server, hey, I need to talk to uh, the MySQL machine, or I need to talk to the, uh, the Keystone server. Um, it would use the roles that map to the, those uh, services uh, instead. So this, this deployment, the roles are all all-in-one compute because you know, it's a single box deployment. But uh, if you had a larger configuration, uh, you would just change out the roles and it would search for those instead. Um, so a lot of these roles are hierarchical, uh, where they will say, you know, we have a, uh, a com we're gonna see examples in a second, but I have, you know, an image role. Well, the image role has, you know, the API service and the registry service underneath it as additional roles. So that service could actually be federate, federated out to multiple machines if necessary. And then whoever's looking for the Glance API can look for the, uh, uh, the role providing that. Maybe it's been rolled up onto one box, maybe it's spread out over a thousand, it doesn't really matter. Um, this is how we wire these together. Uh, but you can use alternate uh, deployments. Uh, so you see our block storage, we're looking for Keystone on the all-in-one compute. Our dashboard, looking for Keystone, all-in-one compute. You know, these guys are looking for Keystone to register their services. Uh, the network service is looking for the Rabbit server. It's on the all-in-one compute. 
everything's on the all-in-one compute. It's kind of convenient that way. Um, here we have our network settings under compute. Uh, we have a fixed, uh, we're building a network at 192.168.124. Uh, the public interface for that is ETH2. If you're calling the Vagrant file, we created an additional NICs on our, on our uh, virtual box. That's what that's for. Uh, for virtualization, uh, for our vert type, Q QMU. <clears throat> because you can run QMU on top of VirtualBox, uh, on top of OSX. Um, for our networks, uh, there's a configuration of our network, our bridge, um, you know, the DNS. That's how we set up our VirtualBox, um, our, our Vagrant image. Fairly simple, uh, but that's, that's what that looks like. So uh, that was our Vagrant file. Uh, we talked about the run list. Any questions? Feel free to ask questions as I'm going. Uh, we looked at the environment. Um, this is the, the Vagrant setup for an all-in-one. You know, I mentioned the developer mode is true. Services all have attributes, and our network setup was there. Is it still broken? All right. Uh, so we saw that the role that this machine is deploying is the all-in-one compute. Uh, if we pull up the all-in-one compute role, which I'll do right here in the roles directory there is an all-in-one compute and it has a run list of two of two additional roles uh, the OS compute single controller and the OS compute worker that is the n plus one pattern right there uh, we just put it all on one box the you know uh, the n plus one is a single controller so our OpenStack compute single controller role could, could be on another box. In this case, it's the same box. And then whoever's running the, uh, the compute ser service as a worker, you know, your hypervisor, they would run the OS compute worker. If we weren't doing all-in-one, we could move those to different boxes. Um, and all the compute nodes would just run the OS compute worker. What's that? Yes. Uh, so. Uh, it's for Chef. So um, we're using Vagrant, but this would, you know, I re you run this on real hardware too. You know, this is just the example. Uh, so you can run all this. Um, so we could drill down into the OS compute. Compute single controller. So a single controller obviously has a lot of stuff going on. Uh, we have a, an OpenStack base role. Um, we could dive into that, see what that has. We have an OS ops database which is going to go and look and see what attribute you set for your database. So it looks like they broke the devs. Hey, Uncle Gary. Hey, hey Ruby. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so we broke the, yeah, whatever. Um, the demo might be broken. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> my demo works. Um, we have the, the ops database, calls into MySQL, configures MySQL. Uh, the uh, OpenStack ops database, goes through and finds all the databases that you're going to create and puts them on uh, the, the, uh, the database that's there. If it's MySQL, calls the right commands. If it's Postgres, calls the right commands. Creates uh, the databases for uh, you know, your image service, your keystone service, your network service, everything that has a database, it runs them. That can be separated out too. If you wanted to run multiple MySQL databases or you know, multiple SQLites or. Yeah. So did you call that out that it doesn't explicitly no, so the cookbooks don't explicitly know about the database backend. Right. You're setting it up by attributes so that you can do whatever kind of deployment you want onto the ops side instead of it being opinionated and forcing it on you. You just tell the two how to talk to each other instead of them depending on or forcing each other. Excuse me? Yes, runless within runless within runless <laughs> within runless. Yeah. So we had all in one single, uh, single controller which calls you know, OS base, which you know, goes and configures, calls common, which sets up the apt repos, configures the logging, you know, and then that bumps up to you know, the OS ops database, which calls base, which calls the database server. It, Chef is smart enough to just deduplicate any duplicates. So all the services call OS base because they all use the, you know, they all need to have those, those same settings. 
So that OS space is in every single role. Um, and it's a role. So, you know, levels of inception here. Um, but, you know, uh, this is our, our, uh, our ops database role. It calls OpenStack ops database server. It doesn't call MySQL. It looks at an attribute and says, oh, MySQL, I'll go off and call the MySQL cookbooks, set those up accordingly. You know, it does a little bit of cleanup and tuning for, for MySQL um, and sets that up as an empty MySQL database. And then we saw that other recipe comes through and creates the databases for OpenStack. Um, you know, so OS Ops messaging, you know, these, you know, it calls OS base, it calls the messaging server, which calls RabbitMQ, you know, it configures RabbitMQ. And it, depending on which version of that you want. Um, and so this goes into, you know, we configure our database, our messaging, and then we configure Keystone, you know, so OS identity. You know, it calls OS base, and then it sets up your identity server and does registration, so it registers Imports. the service. Yeah. Uh, where should we start diving into? Uh, the image cookbook's probably a very good cookbook to start with. All right, so the next thing in the, in the single controller, after we set up Keystone, we're gonna set up Glance. So that's our OS, our OpenStack image uh, role. Actually, though, it's important on the identity while you're doing that. Um, so we saw the image or the identity registration for the services. Uh, it does all of that through attribute inheritance. So it does not do a bunch of searches. There's a couple in there, but it's not looking at your chef server, looking for your environment, intuiting what needs to be set up, and configuring all of the endpoints. Um, you've got the ability to set it up through attributes. It'll do a basic default to 127.0.0.1. It assumes that the Keystone server is itself the endpoint. And, um, it assumes an all-in-one mentality. But that way you can actually lay out through your environment overrides any kind of environment that you want to just deploy. So um, the people that have been running this in production have run into a lot of scenarios whenever you try to do something a little more clever and intuit what your Keystone endpoints should be. We've run into numerous artifacts that don't work right where, oh, this person wants to have their public be some external VIP on an external load balancer or they're a NAT and the IP they want is actually the public IP that's on the top side of a firewall. And so the chef server and chef searches has no capability of intuiting that from inside the firewall. Um, so you've got the ability to override it at the environment level to actually lay down the exact same thing that you want to really lay down. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. So if you don't, you know, if, if chef doesn't understand your network topology, it doesn't have to. You yeah. just say, here's my VIP. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of places where chef <laughs> cannot know yeah. your network topology. And, yeah. Uh, and, you know, and so uh, Keystone gets set up, uh, and then we look at our OS image, and Glance uh, does identity registration. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so image, recipes, identity registration. So this is a chef recipe. Yeah. So. We've let the different cookbooks register their own endpoints. So whenever Matt was talking earlier about the cookbook wrapper model, um, you can put a wrapper on top of this and then play with your run list to have all of your business logic sit inside of the wrapper. And then the cookbook for the component, which is what I'll refer to it now, so the glance component, um, would, through the attribute inheritance, be able to, through that wrapper, go do a whole bunch of business logic if you wanted to write all of that cookbook code to you know, go around inside your network and auto-assemble all of these things, or maybe it's querying some sort of asset management system for IP addresses of different endpoints. And then it can override the cookbook attributes and be able to register its own endpoint. Uh, but as you can see, at the very top of this file, there's not a search for any of this stuff. It just goes through and starts doing its API endpoint to S. So it's gonna set up that string and it's pulling that out of the attribute. So, um, it looks a little weird whenever you first start looking at this, how much information you have to have in your environment uh, because we don't have a bunch of the wrapper cookbook stuff there to show you how to do it. So we're not making the opinionated decisions and we're not doing any of that business logic because really whenever you're doing this, that's the code that's gonna be specific to you. Um, you're gonna have your own business processes that you're gonna wanna have on top of this and wrapping this um, and then pushing all that stuff into the attributes. The second good part of that 
is that testing works really well this way because you can test any type of scenario. As long as you can set a variable inside of an attribute that can be inherited, you can come back and write a test for it on the back side to make sure that it works with any kind of deployment mechanism. So, so yeah. go ahead, I was gonna say. Uh, so this is actually uh, the identity register. This is a resource, uh, a lightweight resource um, in the identity cookbook, uh, in the Keystone cookbook. We've created helpers that make the Keystone calls. So in other cookbooks, they just call uh, the identity register and say, hey, here's the image service. Uh, and then. Yes. Yes. So if we were to. Uh, look in the identity. We could go down into the, the guts. Uh, Provider. Providers. And, you know, there's all the, you know, all the, all the nastiness, uh, <laughs> unpleasantness of, of talking to, you know, the, the key, Keystone API programmatically. We hide this away from you. So you don't have to see that if you're just writing another OpenStack service. And so the the other cookbooks become a lot simpler if you don't have to know all this stuff. Um, the wiring becomes automatic. Um, so you have nice, this pattern of, hey, I need to just register my, my service tenant. And, you know, uh, it's, you know, you just pass in a couple of attributes and the, you know, the nasty wiring happens in the background uh, and you don't have to see it. You just make these keystone calls. Uh, and so all the, different, all the different services that are using keystone, which is all of them, um, have this pattern of you know the tenant, the the reg, you know, the service, the user, you know, you know grant the uh, service user. So it, they just all do this. And almost every single component cookbook has that exact same identity registration. Yeah. Where it pushes out service, creates its service user, grants its service user a certain role, and yeah. so moves on. I, as I mentioned before, you could run the glance services on multiple machines. So here we have the, you know, the OS image role. Inside of it, it has the image registry role and the image API role. So if we look at the OS image registry, you know, there it has the OS base yet again. Um, but it calls the OpenStack image registry uh, recipe. Image registry. You know, and so this is, uh, you know, this is going to go and configure our logging, and then platform options. We've abstracted out the, uh, or encapsulated the platform information into the attributes file. So there's this, show it up. <laughs> uh, so here we see our, our, our platform options there. That is going to the node, the machine that's running it, saying, hey, pull up the OpenStack image platform information. And if we go and look at the attributes file for the image cookbook. There's uh, all this information. Down the bottom. There you go. Platform specific settings. So, you know, the names of the packages. These change from operating system to operating system. Dependencies. The, the dependencies, you know, the names of the services. You know, if it's, you know, Fedora, Red Hat, or CentOS, you know, do, uh, you know, the name of the user is Glance. Uh, but if we're on SUSE, it's OpenStack Glance. We have encapsulated all that, so back in the recipe, it just says, go pull those variables out and pass them into services, into uh, the various resources. And so there's, you know, SUSE, there's Red Hat, there's Ubuntu, uh, you know, and if you have any little variations between them, you can say, hey, if it's Ubuntu 13.04, it's now called this instead of what it used to be. Um, I think that, what's the relationship between recipe and cookbook? So uh, in Chef, a cookbook is uh, a package that provides the configuration of a particular application or a service. So in OpenStack, we've mapped those to the different OpenStack services. So we have an, a Glance cookbook and you know, the image cookbook. And then the recipes are how you configure different settings in that. So for, uh, for Glance, there's a registry service and an API service. So those have separate recipes. Um, if we were talking about something like Apache, I think Apache has about 55 yeah. recipes. 
because Apache has mod, C, you know, mod SSL, mod WSGI, mod PHP, mod, 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 mod. Each one of those has different recipes. And then you would have like the Apache default recipe that's going to install Apache. And then depending on which modules you want on top of that, you could add additional recipes. And it just builds that behavior. Uh, they call the, the recipes. So the, uh, the roles, you know, the roles c can contain run lists and, you know, but eventually uh, at the end of the, uh, the end of this inheritance chat is recipes. You know, so recipes and recipes are contained in cookbooks. Um, and we, well, I'll pull up the chef client run and we can actually see that uh, in a second. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, good question. Um, so what time does this end? Uh, 1040 or 1030. Okay, I forgot to say. 1030? Oh. So we got 30 minutes. Okay, 30 minutes. Um, so that's the, the attributes for Glance, you know, uh, pulling out that platform specific information. Um, then we install, you know, uh, this is a chef recipe. We have a resource called package. It's going to install Python Keystone. I guess that's called the same thing everywhere. Yeah, that, that needs to be fixed. That needs to be fixed. Uh, we could definitely, somebody, eventually that will be, you know, called something different on a different platform. We'll pull it out. We usually don't hard code things. Uh, but here we see our database user, the OpenStack image DB username. You know, it just finds whatever that attribute is, um, finds our database password. Uh, that is a, a helper method there, DB password. Uh, the common cookbook has a bunch of helpers um, to find, to hide away to, you know, that sort of complexity. Yeah, well, that one specifically does a so the DB password's kind of interesting. We do randomized passwords unless you're setting developer mode to true, which you're doing inside of the demo. Um, but the DB password helper will actually go through and find if the attribute exists in the environment. If it doesn't, it auto-generates a new random password and then uploads that back so that all additional calls to that will use that new newly generated password. Then we go down to the SQL connection. Uh, this is using another one of the helper. Um, so the DB URI goes through the environment overrides and assembles the connection string that you're going to drop inside the comp file. So it's going to look for things like your DB type, which could be Postgres, MySQL, SQLite. Um, it's going to set that up into the string that is expected to be inside of the comp file. Um, you know, so it's going to be usually like MySQL colon colon whack whack. And then it's going to start doing DB username and password. So glance at glance. And then it will also set up the connection string for the IP to the database. If you're running MySQL as an example, if it's SQLite, it's just going to give a file path. Uh, do we install curl? Why do we install curl? Yeah, I don't know. Oh, uh, the glance. Uh, oh, this is image, the image upload. Yeah, the image upload uses curl. Um, yeah. No. Uh, yeah, there, so. Uh, in the Vagrant uh, environment, remember it said uh, developer mode is true. Uh, if developer mode is false, we have an encrypted data bag, which is a way of storing encrypted data on the Chef server. Um, it would use that. Uh, that needs better documentation. Yeah. So in that <laughs> case, if you've got a set, instead of letting the Chef cookbooks create an automatic password like the example I just gave, if you know which ones you want to carry around for your ops team, you can upload them in the encrypted data bag, and then whenever these recipes run, it will lay down the passwords that they expect. Yeah. Yep. Um, so then we have our, our, our database type, uh, and then we're going to install our DB type Python packages. So in this case, you know, MySQL, MySQL libraries. Python packages, yeah. which go back to that attribute where we defined what they're called on SUSE, on Ubuntu, on Red Hat. Uh, installs them, just loops over them. The names of the image packages, this, you know, again, changing between platforms. Uh, then we're going to create uh, the caching directory. Set it to the right user and password. With the right user and password, and the right mode. Uh, then we're going to create the image registry. Um, going, finding what it's called on <laughs> your particular platform. This is actually better than it could be. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, then. You know, if we had all this conditional logic within the recipe, it'd be uh, much more confusing. Yeah, you take the five lines and multiply it by, what, 10? Every, every platform, yeah. yeah. So you end up with about 50 lines of code inside of the, inside of the cookbook. Uh, here we see, um, 
you know, Ooh. occasionally we have operational issues that, you know, the field has found, we fix them in the cookbooks. So, you know, pass the value on to you. Um, <laughs> here we clean up uh, SQLite because we're actually using a full database. Um, that's a bug. <laughs> uh, then we create our, our Etsy glance directory. Um, and the thing about Chef is these resources are item potent. That means every time they run, it's safe to run them multiple times. So Chef is going to go and say, hey, I'm going to create Etsy Glance, and it's going to be owned by this uh, user with this group and this mode. And if that directory is already there, it doesn't do anything. Uh, but if you know, the first time it runs, it sets that up. Maybe somebody came in, changed the settings on it. Chef runs again. It's like, that's not how it's supposed to be. Let me fix that for you. Uh, we call this convergence, you know, c setting up a machine and keeping it in the, the enforcing the policy that you want on these machines. Uh, this is looking to see if we have defined uh, an interface to listen to. Um, you know, we'll go and get uh, the right address depending on which NIC you're exposing. Maybe you're only listening on an admin network uh, for connections to Glance. Uh, then here we're going to, t we have a templated uh, Glance registry file that we uh, have uh, an ERB file. Uh, so ERB is uh, the templating language uh, of choice for Ruby. Um, so if we were to pull up that template, glance, registry, conf, ERB, you know, it's your glance config file uh, for the registry with a bunch of variables that get pas passed into it. You know, this way we can you know, uh, dynamically create configuration files. And uh, OpenStack has a lot of configuration files. Yes, it does. <laughs> and here you can see us passing uh, the various variables that the uh, config file needs to know about. Yeah, and we're really trying on this. So if, if you've ever done much inside a template with Chef before, you can go one of three ways. Um, you can define everything you want, pass it into the template, and then whenever he was looking at the template, you saw things that had an at symbol and were the variable versus node, you know, and then what looks like a hash tree. So the at symbol ones are using the variables that are defined inside of the template block whenever you're passing in. So a lot of people will start out by passing everything in that they want to template out. Um, so they'll collect everything that could possibly go into that file, and you end up with this variable list that looks like this big, and you throw that into the template, and everything has got this at foo, do something with it, and print it. Uh, the second way is you can actually hit all of the node attributes directly. So like node app stack image service tenant name, that's an attribute that's set. I don't have to do anything with it to compose that. Um, and so you can not pass that into the template and the template has direct access to the node variables, uh, the node attribute variables. What we've been trying to do is work towards as little as possible, but anything that you have to compose, so inside of the recipe, if you need to, you know, concatenate like three or four variables together to produce like a URI string, that would be the only thing that we would try and pass into the templates and then use the node attributes as much as possible inside of the templates, um, which is back to that whole point of everything can be overridable through that environment and node attribute templates. Yeah. Um, and then we notice here at the end of our template, if we make any changes to our glance registry conf, uh, we're going to restart the image registry service. So. You know, maybe uh, a URL changed. Maybe uh, your database connections changed. Um, you can actually go and, uh, you know, any little change that happens to that config file, Chef says, oh, it changed? Let me restart the service so it picks up that change. Um, and, so, and actually, uh, there's two ways to do this, too. So um, it, this is one of the fun parts about this being community. You'll see everyone's got their own little habits. And so if you look at a git blame and see someone from me or my team, you'll see maybe this type of model where the template will notify the service. The service can also subscribe to the template. Yeah. So you can do the exact same thing just backwards. So the service will automatically restart itself anytime it notices a change on the comp file. Or if the comp file changes, you can start it and send a notification service over to the right. actual service and restart it. And, and, and with, no, with OpenStack, uh, especially Nova, uh, there are a lot of services that share single config files. Like everything? So, yeah. <laughs> everything in Nova? Everything in Nova? Is there any problem with doing both? No, there's not a problem with doing both. No. Uh, we just haven't 
enforced a style. Um, it's pedantic. Well, and, yeah, and, yeah, so I think the Nova cookbook actually does a lot of the services subscribe to changes on the template um, because it was just a too many to one to do it the other way. That way every little service has just got one line instead of a template having 25 notify lines. Yeah. Um, but there's also some racy stuff that can happen on the immediately versus delay. So Chef can actually queue up all of those and not execute them immediately. Immediately means that it's going to do a template and then everything that subscribes to it is gonna restart. If you do that like inside of Nova, whenever you may be having two or three services on the same box that might be changing comp files inside of the same configuration file, you might restart services four times during a run. Um, so that you can use a delayed, which will allow them all to make their modifications but not do any restarts, and then at the end of the run, it'll collect all those delayed notifications and then run them once. Yeah. So there's a bit of that that's so-so. Um, that's one of those operational things that people contribute a lot of fixes to. Yeah. Because they're like, ah, I've seen this and we restart Keystone 12 times in a run. And so they'll go through and put a patch in to flip the way it works to get it down to a one and use delayed. And in this example, we're restarting the image service uh, because we're usually following this up yeah. with uh, image uploading. And if the registry is not right. ready or it hasn't caught those changes, our image uploads will fail. So, you know, uh, live and learn. Yeah. So we. <laughs> Lay down the comp file, we notify the registry service, which is dependent on the comp file, and restart the registry service. And then we go through and set up the database. Yeah. Uh, we go set up our database. Um, you know, more uh, the glance registry paste INI file, which. Actually, this is a great example. If you go back up, we're going to restart this service twice back to back. Yes. And not really do much in the middle. But, you know, yeah, yeah. We're not doing much in the middle, but it actually, if, if only one of these comp files changed, we'd want, so yeah. There, there's sometime a little bit of churn during a Chef client run. Um, so uh, that was the image registry. Go to API. Uh, the image API you know, is not that different. I mean, it's just another service getting set up. It has the OS base there. Uh, the OpenStack image API reg uh, recipe. API recipe, you know, this probably looks a little similar. Uh, we're going to, you know, handle our, our, uh, our logging, oh my God. pull in our platform options, install the same packages that we installed in the other one. Maybe these services aren't on the same box, so there's a little bit of redundancy. It's safe with Chef. It doesn't really matter. It says, got it, don't need to do anything. Got it, don't need to do anything. Um, here we look over our platform options. We're installing the image packages. This was in the other recipe. It's OK. Um, we could clean this up a little. It's not that bad. Uh, here we have the uh, image API service, um, you know, creating the Etsy glance directory. There's a lot of redundancy in here. Yeah. Uh, we could definitely clean this up. Um, you know, the, the policy JSON as another template, restarting the API service immediately. Uh, well, some of that's OpenStackness, too. Like yeah. OpenStack does a really kind of crazy job with Keystone and Glance specifically where two services are expected to be running on the same box but can be running on different boxes and they both depend on the same sets of files instead of having their own directories. And yeah. There's a little weirdness there. Um, yeah, so here we're building uh, URIs, uh, node by the developer, you know, hey, we need to move this stuff out of here. Um, off URI should contain two in most cases, but if it's three, we leave it off, you know. Uh, as you start to deploy this stuff, people find these bugs. The nice thing is, you know, if you're a small shop like me, uh, you know, you have people like at and to find these bugs for you, uh, or Rackspace to fix things for you, which is another reason to use community cookbooks. Um, here we're finding the endpoints for our uh, service. Uh, note here we're looking for the uh, registry endpoint. Endpoint is a helper method. It looks for the image registry. That goes and says, oh, uh, is there, you know, where is that? It's on, the, uh, it's on the same box in this case. So we don't actually have to search. Um, you know, building up our, uh, if we're using Swift, building up our uh, Swift URLs. Um, if our glance flavor is Keystone, we have all this you know, caching management. Then going and seeing <laughs> which endpoint we're listening on. 
and then you know, the writing off. the API conf, passing in a bunch of settings, restarting the service, template, template. You know, we're restarting that service multiple times in case any of them changed independent of the others. Um, and this one doesn't have it immediately. Um, <laughs> so, and then we have a, a cron job to go and clean up uh, the glance cache pruner. Oh God, there's more. Um, yeah, there's a lot here. There's a lot here. And then we get into image upload. Yeah, and then wanted to get to this part. We have a helper uh, built in called OpenStack Image Image. Uh, this says uh, the OpenStack Image is the name of the cookbook, and then Image is the name of the service, or of the, uh, the resource that is, is contained in here. This abstracts away the, uh, image you know, upload the, the, the joy of, of uploading images into Glance. Um, it understands the difference uh, between uh, QCOW and uh, AMIs and has helpers uh, that, you know, behind the scenes will open up your QCAL files or open up your AMIs and pass the right commands to the Glance command line tool. Um, but, you know, we don't want all this logic back in our recipe uh, multiple times, so we, you know, put it into a handy resource like this. So, so let's actually take a look at the Chef Client run uh, that's happened here. Um, so we had we had our, our, you know, our controller uh, role that dives into all the different OpenStack services. It goes and uh, configures everything, uh, and then it keeps coming back up. Uh, eventually, it goes into the OS Compute Worker when it finishes setting up all the, the OpenStack services. Um, so let's take a look at what that actually looks like uh, when it runs. So this uh, is not live, obviously, um, but this is the output of uh, doing the Vagrant up on uh, the demo. So if you follow along, if you download the instructions and you run this on your own, uh, this is what it looks like. And I just want to point out some of the things that are happening here. Uh, we're going to vagrant up the Ubuntu 12.04 image. Uh, so we're going to import that base box. Um, this is just you know, setting it up on VirtualBox. Uh, and then the, the vagrant chef zero plugin is going to start up. Uh, here we see the chef server actually starts. This is a Ruby application. And it starts listening on port 4000 and says, hey, I'm going to upload everything that's in this Chef repo. I'm going to look in the environments directory. I'm going to pull the example environment, the testing environment, the vagrant environment. And I'm going to go through all the roles that are there. And there are a lot of roles. There's too many roles. Some might say there are too many roles. There might be too much OpenStack. Yeah. Uh, and then it says, hey, I got all the roles. I got all the environments. This is next, the, the Burke Shelf plugin is going to say, hey, I'm going to upload all the cookbooks to the Chef server uh, that are in use here. And so these are all the dependencies that OpenStack needs to run. Um, so the Apache cookbook, the apt cookbook, the AWS cookbook, which is a dependency of MySQL, so you can run MySQL on AWS. It doesn't get used, but it gets uploaded. Um, you know, build essential for building things from source, the database cookbook, the Erlang cookbook, used by Rabbit, Memcache, MySQL, OpenSSL, uh, packages isn't used anymore, uh, Postgres, Rabbit, XFS, Yum. And then it goes in, uh, the Burks file actually has the tags in Git, off of GitHub of the, the SHAs that we're building from. So it, it says, hey, I'm going to go get the block storage that was known to work. Uh, I'm going to grab the OpenStack common off of this SHA. Uh, so it actually understands those sorts of things. So as you're continuing to develop, you can go in and change the SHAs. You can point it to local paths. You know, pull up the Burks file. You know, if you haven't seen Burks file, it's, uh, you, know, you just list the cookbooks from the community site with their versions. Uh, or you can list, you know, here we were just pulling from tip you know, off of. Uh, well, we shipped the Burks file locks. Yeah, here. actually, we shipped the lock file. But uh, you could delete the lock file and then run off a of tip. So you can see all the shots are there on Stackforge, it's community cookbooks. Right, and the nice thing about using this type of thing is that development can happen on the different component cookbooks, but that doesn't mean you have to immediately start consuming it. So um, whenever we have something that we get past our tests that's enough that needs to be pulled into the cookbooks, we can go and change the Burks file lock to point to the next version. So let's say we start at 7.0, 
three or four developers do different bug fixes and we get to like a 704, if that one is one of the ones that has enough fixes that we want to bring in, then we can go back into the cookbook, the ops code um, chef repo, and actually update it to use 704, but the whole time it's still been on 70. So there's been development going on, but if you were doing deployment, you're stuck to stable-ish yeah. cookbook. So we try to keep stable stuff in the chef repo, uh, you know, so it's stable. Yeah. <laughs> and there's uh, work to be done there. Yeah, so here we see uh, the chef client, or the vagrant is uploading all those cookbooks, pulling them from Git uh, with the, the Berkshelf plugin. And uh, then it uploads them all to Chef Zero, you know, which is running uh, on the box. Then it does the standard uh, Vagrant VirtualBox setup of you know, creating our shared folders. Here we're forwarding our ports, 443 uh, for uh, the, the uh, dashboard, 4000 yeah. 4, for Chef Zero. So we can actually use Knife from our workstation to talk to the Vagrant image. And then um, the EC2 and Nova OpenStack. Yeah, computer. and the EC2 and OpenStack APIs. Uh, excuse me? Uh, not yes. yet. Not yet. Um, this is all setting up the VM, you know, and then, uh, you know, we see waiting for our machine to boot. Uh, machine booted and ready, sets so the host name, uh, configures our stuff, and here is uh, the Omnibus. It says installing Chef 11.8 Omnibus package. It actually goes and, you know, in the, the Vagrant file, we said latest. It checks with uh, uh, Omnitruck, which is the API service uh, at Opscode. It says, hey, I need the latest version. Downloads it, installs it. Um, you know, here we see it installing Chef. Thank you for installing Chef. And then it uh, registers that machine with Chef Zero. It says, oh, uh, what's the Chef server that I'm supposed to use? Chef Zero, it's on the same box, nice and fast, doesn't have to go out to the internet. Um, and then it starts our Chef client run. Uh, Actually, so that's the part you might want to talk about right there, the run list to the expanded run list. Yeah, yeah, so here's our Chef Zero run, and then here we see our run list uh, of apt and the all-in-one compute that we passed in from Vagrant. It says, hey, this is what it was set, and then that gets, oh, that gets expanded uh, our run list expands to that. That is OpenStack all-in-one, all the recipes. Um, there's a lot of them. <laughs> uh, and OpenStack uh, keeps getting bigger. Uh, and the last thing we see there is OpenStack compute compute, which is our compute worker role. Um, so it actually goes through, sets up you know, the database, the messaging, image, or identity, image, Networking. network, compute. on and on and on. Uh, and so here we see, you know, starting that run with that run list. And download downloading all, all those cookbooks, which are local, so it's nice and fast. Ah, I keep going. Uh, then it starts doing the Chef Client run, creating my SQL. Uh, you know, creating our database users for our different services. You know, dashboard, Keystone, Glance, Solometer, Quantum. Um, we have Solometer running, but it's not actually used. Right. But, you know. It will be used for Havana. Then we see you know, the RabbitMQ configuration. It keeps going. Uh, here we see Keystone creating. Bootstrap admin users. Yeah, uh, you know, the. the uh, compared this to the uh, Rackspace uh, DevStack. <laughs> okay, compared to Rackspace. Rackspace doesn't use DevStack. Yeah. That's an OpenStack project, yes. I mean, to some degree, they're both a little bit comparable because they're both attempting to do the same thing by managing the comp files and laying down um, OpenStack. Uh, DevStack was meant to be a really simple way for people to look at how you're supposed to configure it and to do some testing. Um, it allows you to use different Git branches for all the different projects and run testing harnesses against it, uh, and it's used for the gating and upstream. Uh, this is more targeted at production deployments. So, yeah. you know, you can yeah, lay yeah. out your environment um, to define your deployment and then be able to run through it and get 
exactly that deployment and guarantee consistency with Chef Client running every 30 minutes and whacking every single comp file change that you make by hand right back to what Chef wants it to be. Yeah, DevStack is not for production. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the Chef Client run goes, it does Glance, it does Quantum, you know, it does uh, setting up you know, the L3 agent, you're networking. I'm going through this fast because we're getting towards the end of the session. Sender, sender volume, setting up our SCSI. You know, each one of these is going back to Keystone. Sets up uh, your dashboard. Uh, here we are setting up uh, the dashboard, um, and then you know, installing packages. Uh, then our compute nodes, uh, the, the compute service starts up. Lib, you know, libvirt bin. Whew. And that took 200 <laughs> and uh, it took 2,100 seconds. Uh, if you do the math, that's slow. Yeah. A virtual box is slow, and uh, my network was slow, but that, that's why I canned it, so we didn't have to sit through it. Um, and then, uh, the, the VM actually came up. Uh, oh, that's too small. So this is the end of the Chef Client run. And then on the live machine, I did uh, Vagrant SSH Ubuntu 1204 and logged into my VM. And uh, here I fixed the, the, the PS1. Uh, I sourced the OpenRC. This is all the instructions. So I sourced the OpenRC, listed my Nova services. They all came up. You know, they're all the Nova services. They listed the hypervisors, the quantum agents. Uh, and then I did glance image create the Cirrus image from uh, the URL that's in all the documentation. Um, and that brought in our, our glance image. Uh, you know, that, can, that part can be automated. You know, here's the list of the images. It worked. Then I did Nova boot test an image. And I built that Cirrus image. I looked at it. I said, that's pretty cool. Uh, show it to me. Yep, it's active. Well, let's go ahead and SSH into it. And so actually SSH into uh, the Cirrus image and did a PSAUX, you know, hey, Cirrus, this is exciting. Uh, I don't think you'd want to, yeah, but. You, it's probably possible. Yeah. I would not recommend it. Uh, the question was, can you call puppet scripts from inside of Chef clients? And you probably could if you want to do all that work. But you know, this is the, the VM. Uh, I think I just exited out of it. But um, that was actually running top on the Cirrus image. <laughs> so uh, that VM is, so I'm running a VM on top of a VM on top of uh, OS X. <laughs> Inception. Inception. Uh, there are people who are doing that. Yeah. Yeah. There so there's some work on that. Um, yeah. That's actually one of the things they're working on through Icehouse is pulling in more of the config management providers as first class extensions inside of Heat. Um, so then that way you can orchestrate. Because right now you can do it because you can pass in different shell commands into a Heat template and execute whatever you want. But they're going to actually try and bring those up as to first order attributes and be able to integrate um, Chef and Puppet and Salt and Ansible, those things, so into Heat. And the dashboard is up on our, uh, our, our VM. So I think if we go to project, instances, there's our service image. So I'm actually accessing the dashboard of the VM and looking at the VM that's on the VM. And Kinda cool. Time. And that's our time. <laughs> uh, Uh, yeah, so um, in the, the uh, we had a developer discussion yesterday of people working on these cookbooks. Um, there will definitely be some upgrade work being done. IBM said they already had it. Yeah, we do too. Um, um, so that, there's a little bit of weirdness on that. Um, at, most of the people involved are contributing upgrade stuff. However, we're finding some things that we could probably work around in Chef on the OpenStack upgrades themselves. Um, but sometimes it may involve you running a couple of hand commands before you do chef runs on your, up, on your nodes to upgrade. Um, and that changes between every single version. Um, we've typically found about three artifacts on all of the upgrades that 
you end up going, okay, on your Keystone server, go and do these two commands first and then run through. Um, and or, you know, the last one, maybe it was a, a glance one or a sender one. Um, but yeah, that we're gonna be working on that and we'll eventually get gating on upgrades in there too. Documentation is always in progress. Yeah. Uh, and it's all up on GitHub. And as I mentioned, you know, I'll put the slides up and... Uh, uh, that's a longer question, and yeah. I, is it time or? Yeah, so. Uh, Saved by the bill. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, uh, you know, please take the time. You know, follow the instructions. Uh, thank you.